Good evening. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Emor. And I'm going to jump to the end of the Sedra in just a moment. But I was supposed to, tonight is Monday night, and I was supposed to record last night. And there was a technical reason that we couldn't do it last night. Why did I want to record last night? Because it was May 8th. Yeah. And I once heard Rabbi Friend speak about General and President Eisenhower. See, he, Rabbi Friend, and I were both young children when Eisenhower was the president in the 50s. And the perception out there, because he liked golf so much, that he was like a lazy type of a president. The moment he had the opportunity, he was back on the golf course. But we want to give him his due and his credit. And that's why I mentioned this in such a session of Torah, because when he liberated on May 8th, 1945, the camps and the situation, the war, he brought in a ton, a load of photographers and cameramen, and he wanted that in every concentration camp they should take every picture they could. Because he said that there's going to come a day that there will be Holocaust deniers. People doubted what he said. They said, can't be. No one would ever, after what happened in the millions, not in the thousand, the million. How could somebody ever deny? And he said, you will see. As time will pass, so I want to document it to the best of our ability. And to his great foresight and credit, he, the pictures and the films that we have of the Holocaust today are because of General of President Eisenhower. Now, he had a Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, he was a big anti-Semite, but Eisenhower overruled him a number of times in favor of Eretz Yisrael. And it was crucial moments, critical moments for Eretz Yisrael. And he was very forceful in his opinion and what he decided the route for America and what it should take in regard to the Middle East against his Secretary of State. So as a commemoration of that day, uh, we just thought that it was, I felt proper and appropriate to give the credit that's due. Uh, unlike what most Americans reminisce and think of him as a mediocre president, no luster, nothing special. He really was, because he was the general that directed the traffic at the end of the war. And there, are, I'm not going to go into it, this is a Parsha class, but I thought I would take the two or three minutes to just properly acknowledge what he did, because there were several stories of people reunited and everything because he gave the order that they should do this and this while they came in to the people to liberate them. And they were still in shambles and rags, starving, everything. And, and he was really very, it was very noteworthy um, and laudable what he did and how he did it. Uh, and he turned out to be a shlich of our Kurdish Baruch Hu in favor of us. 
and we remember him fondly and with great appreciation for what he did. Now, I'm jumping to the end of the Sedra because at the very tail end of Parshas Emor, there is a story of a Noikev Shem Hashem. That means somebody had a fight with another Yid and he, one of the two decided during the fight to curse Hashem's name. So the Mephoshim are curious that if you're fighting with someone, why would he curse the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Curse the man who he's fighting with. So we're going to take a moment to just go back historically. Who was this man? And we have to go back to Parsha Shemos that there was a man named Dasan, who all of you remember, a very famous troublemaker. And he was a one of the Jewish people who oversaw a segment, a regiment of Yidden to produce the bricks and everything that Paro wanted. Now, if somebody at the end of the day didn't produce what they were supposed to, they were beaten and their child was taken and thrown into the cement. It was ugly what happened. Um, this Dustin and his pal Aviram decided that they are not going to beat any Jews up, which was really what their job was if someone didn't produce their daily ration. So he was beaten up by the Egyptian instead. Oh, you didn't produce the number, you didn't beat them up, so we're beating you up. And they were beaten up because it was strange that he survived. And when Pyro said, Va'amar Pyro, Levne Yisrael, so the Mephart and say, What do you mean, Levne Yisrael? They were already out of Egypt. So who was he talking to? So they said he was talking to Dustin Naviram. And they left after all the Jews left. And when they got to the sea, it split for them. Separately, so says Targum Yonis and Ben Uziel. Why? Because they didn't beat up their fellow Jews. And they took the beating themselves. But what happened with this Dosun? He was married. And... One morning, when it was pitch black, the Egyptian boss came in to wake up Dosun, that he should go to work. He wasn't at work, and it was dark outside. He was supposed to go. So Dosun jumped out of the bed, and he ran to work. This Egyptian violated Dosun's wife. He wanted to get him out of the tent so he could violate his wife, which is what he did. Now, Dawson went back to the tent for something and found this Egyptian there. So the wife told him, I didn't, it was pitch black. I thought it was you. I didn't know that it was someone else. And the Egyptian was afraid that it would become known. So he started to fight with Dawson to kill him. And that's when Moshe Rabbeinu stepped in and killed the Mitzri. That's the Egyptian that he killed. Now, the, the Noik of Shem Hashem in our parsha was the 
result of that union of the Egyptian with Mrs. Dawson. And this child was born from that union. And the person he was fighting with said to him, says the Medrash, said to him, oh, do you know how your father died? His father was the Egyptian. His mother was Shlomas Bas Divri, the Jewish woman. And he said, no. He said, well, Moshe Rabbeinu said Hashem's name, God's name, and killed your father and buried him right there in the sand. So when he heard that, he cursed the name, said, oh, with the God's name? So I am cursing God's name. And that's why he cursed God. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and not the other person. Now, right after this story, there are a number of halachas that are said. You'll see that by you have to treat carefully a ger, and if someone kills somebody else, that you he dies, and if someone destroys the money of someone else, he has to pay for it. There's responsibility in terms of taking a life or taking property that doesn't belong to one's self. So the reason that these halachas suddenly appear is because the Torah wants to tell you that over here, Hashem Paskind, in other words, they didn't know what to do with this Mikal. They put him in a jail temporarily because there's nothing in the Jewish religion as jail. That means we rehabilitate people who do things, or if they do such serious things, they give up their life. There's, there's retribution for certain things. A person's Mikal Shab is amazing with Hasro, with Adem, so then there's a price that he pays. But we wanted, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted you to know, call yourself to know, that it's not just he paskin, that if someone curses his name, he's, he dies. But I'm worried about the covet of each and every Yid. And that's why those halachas follow immediately after a sensitivity lesson in regard to each and every Yid's worth and value in the general arena of this world. Now, Rav Moshe Feinstein said that the reason that these halachas are stated right after the story of this Mikalo is because they were going to take the life of this man, and, and he was killed. So to teach us that when you're going to take the life of another Yid, you have to be sensitized. So we went through five or six psukim, that if you take someone else's life, you die, because that person has selam elokim. Hashem's not just worried about his own covet, but you have to know the worth. That means don't get used to because you are the executioner, that life is nothing. Life is very valuable. And you have to know it before you take the life of it, even under the umbrella of permissible act. Uh, and that, that's the halacha. Somebody had to kill him. Excuse me. So says Rav Moshe Feinstein, that's why those halachas end up right then and there in the parsha, because that was our kasha, it just seems way out of order, and it even talks about kager ke'ezrach, that a ger, somebody becomes a Jew, you would think, well, maybe all these halachas that we're saying doesn't apply to him. He became a Yid, he grew up his whole life as a Goy, and his father is still a Goy. 
that no, once he entered into the threshold of Yiddishkeit, of Yidden, of becoming a Yid, so then he is under the umbrella of being a full-fledged Yid, and that's why 36 times in the Torah, it says, Kager Ke'ezrach, that a Ger has the same status as any citizen, any regular Yid who's functioning as a Yid in its full flourish and value. Now, the Pasik opens and says, Vayetse, uh, that this blasphemer who cursed, that means blasphemy, cursed Hashem, he went out. So Rashi points out, like, what do you mean he went out? From where? Where did he go? So Rashi says he went out from the Parsha that's right before this story, the Lechem HaPonim. We know there were 12 showbreads that were put on every Shabbos on the Shulchan, and the old ones were taken off. But when the old ones were taken off, they were still piping hot and fresh as the minute they were put on the previous week before. So he went out, this blasphemer, and he heard, they just got done hearing about the Shulchan. And he said, what? Is that the way to treat a king with a week, old, week's old bread? And he cursed Hashem. Now, the Imriemis asks, why did he curse? What did he find negative? Everyone knew that it was warm and it was still piping hot. So there was a miracle done. So what was he so upset about? If it would have been stone cold, okay. I mean, you can't take it off and, and give it and do with it whatever they did with it. But it was piping hot. So what was he so upset about? So the Imre Emma said that the way you perceive a situation, if you have a jaundiced view, then that's what it becomes. Here it was hot. He should have been very proud of the miracle that a week later it was hot. But if you have a negative eye and that's how you look at things, that that's what the Metsias in your mind even if in front of your face, you see that the breads were hot. But there are some people that they turn sour on a given person or a given situation and you cannot detour them. You can't convince them otherwise. They have a warped, twisted opinion. <laughs> Excuse me, and these, the... The perception is so twisted and so warped that you can't get them out of that mode. And the Shulchan was so outstanding when the Oile Regolim, three times a year, Klal Yisrael, who lived in Eretz Yisrael, came up to Yerushalayim. And when they left at the end of the, their pilgrimage, it says that the Kohanim picked up the Shulchan, and when the Yidin were on their way out of Yerushalayim on the hill, they could see that the Kohanim picked up the Shulchan to show them the bread, that it was such an outstanding nest that they wanted them to leave with the taste of the shulchan. Interestingly, Mephorshim say that why was that nest, that miracle, shown to them? There were, look in Pirkei Avos, it says, Asara Nisim, there were 10 different miracles that happened in the base of Migdash. 
So why only this miracle did they pick up and show them? But the answer is, we know there's a halacha that a shul should have 12 windows. And if you go into new shuls, you may not realize it, but if you take a moment to look and you count the windows in the shul, in the main sanctuary, there's 12. And it's connected to Shiv Deka. And the Mephorshim say, why? I mean, we could do something else in the shul, but why do we want to bring a representation of the 12 tribes of the Shvatim? So the Mephorshim say, because Yidin are diverse, as we see from Birchus Yaakov, that when he blessed, when he gave a bracha, <coughs> excuse me, to each and every one of his sons, they were vastly different. There was n not two were alike. Each one he knew the trunas nefesh of each person, of each son, and according to that, he blessed him. He gave him the bracha, which means that we have to excel in the gift given to us. And as in Pirkei Avos last week, it says that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai had five Talmidim. What do you mean he had five Talmidim? He had 500 Talmidim, maybe 5,000 Talmidim. So why does the Mishnah say, it doesn't say, around five, or he says he had five Talmidim. So the Mepharshim explained because these five excelled in an area in Avoidus Hashem, in service of our Kodesh Baruch Hu, so outstandingly that they served as a molding influence instilled into the hearts of Klal Yisrael, and it taught each and every year that you are born with innate talents and ability, and you should work on bringing that to fruition. Take your strength and something that is a natural talent, a natural gift given to you by a Kurdish Baruch Hu, develop it, and bring it out in its full luster. So he had more than five Talmudim, but these five were so outstanding in the Nakuda that was their specialty that that's why he mentioned them. And he, and as the B'nai Sosna talks about it in Mimer Gimel of of Chodesh Ir, that Mishnah explaining why the five said the things they did. Rebbe Lazar, Rebbe Herkin has said, um, Ayin Tova, that the, the most exceptional Mida a person could have is to see things with a good eye. And he so explains the Bnei Soscher why each one of those five are found in one specific Pasek in Bereshus, which I'm not going to go into right now, but magnificently explains where each piece of the puzzle falls and why each of the five adopted to excel in a given area based on that single Pusik that they all learned it out from. And since from the beginning of Bereshus told the word Tov, it's 32 words, which is late. That's why Rabbi Lazar ben Aruch said that a good heart is more than everything else that was said here. I agree with him that that is the most outstanding cementing factor that a person could have as a backbone in his life. Because he said, Lev Tov. And Lev is 32, Lamed Beis. And from the word Beratius till the word Tov is 32 words. So therefore he picked in that Pasek, his choice was Lev Tov because he felt the remez, the hint, 
was so outstanding and so strong that it was able to uh, find its way into the hearts of each and every person and to teach that a person can excel in the gift that he was given, his talents, his ability, his strengths, uh, and bring that out, and that should be his his power in life of achievement. So when the Yidden came, there were all types of Yidden. There were Svardim, there were Litvisha, there were Hasidish, and there were all different types. And that's the reason we have 12 windows in the shul, because every shavit has its uniqueness. And to teach everyone that we have to coexist with other type of yidden. It doesn't mean yidden who are not from. That means we can't say, well, you know, we're from, uh, but the others are busy eating uh, a ham and cheese sandwich, you know, and that's the way they chuck. Something that's a, obviously against the Torah we're not talking about. But in the framework of Yiddishkeit and being careful uh, with mitzvahs, you still find many different drachim. Some have these men hug him, some have those men hug him. And we have to learn how to be tolerant and appreciate that my way is the way I have my minig, my custom. But there are others who have a different way of doing the davening or the minhagim. Uh, and we have to learn how to accept them. So that's why there were 12 windows. Because we can daven 12 different ways. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and say Shemana Esrei. But each one reaches Shemayim. And that's why there's 12 windows representing 12 different Shvatim who each had a different Tchunas nefesh, as Yaakov Avinu expressed. So when the Yidden came to Harabayas, there was a mixture, like you go to Vasik in Minyan by the Koiso. You see, there's a minion here of Svardim, and they pronounce and say everything differently. And right next to them is a Litvisha minion, and next to them are three different types of Hasidim, three different minyonim. Everyone davening, and everyone, when it comes the second of the nets, it becomes silent, and everyone totally silent with 2,000 people there, each one in his cluster. In each one in his group of minyanim, suddenly by nets, it becomes silent in one split second. And everyone begins Shemana Esrei. Because each one with their own way, but to bring out the best of their avoidus HaKodesh, we have to appreciate. And that's the reason that the Koyhanim did not do a different Ness to part with Kla Yisrael as they waved to them and they were going out of Yerushalayim back home, they showed them the shulchan because there were 12 breads and each and every bread represented a different shavit. And you're going back home, you were just together part and parcel with Kla Yisrael. And when you're part and parcel with Klal Yisrael, you were one. There was unity. Now you're going back home. Be equally as tolerant with the Jews back home in your shul, in your city, in your township, as you were on the Harabayas, because the 12 represent 12 different ways. But you were tolerant, and there was unity. Make sure it's maintained when you finally get home. Now, there is a Pasuk in this week's Sedra 
ולא זכללו השם קודשי ונקדשתי בסוף בני ישראל. So when we say ולא זכללו, it means that we can't make a chil Hashem. So if we can't make a chil Hashem, what does v'nikdashti besoch b'nei Yisrael mean? So Rashi says, misor atzmecha v'kadesh Make a kiddush Hashem. Yes, the first half of the Pasuk is talking about live your life that you can always make a Kiddush Hashem when you're walking out of a supermarket and there's someone behind you not from or maybe not even a Yid and you hold the door or you help get through the door with the person's buggy, the carriage with the food, with that. any little thing can promote and make a Kiddush Hashem a sanctification of our Kodesh Baruch Hu's name. So in one Pasuk we have, don't do the negative, and uh, the example I always give with, you know, don't cut somebody off in a line driving just because you want 15 seconds more you're making a chil Hashem. They see a black hat, they see a beard, or they see that it's someone with a yarmulke on their hat, head. They know you're a yid. Why make the chil Hashem for 15 seconds? So that is the velosa chalalu. But v'nikdashti v'soch b'nei Yisrael that the Medrash says a lot of discussion about what this Mesor Atzmecha V'Kadesh Shemi and it really amounts to self-sacrifice. Now we think, many people think, that to be Makadish Kiddush Hashem, a person has to be thrown in a fire and burnt at the stake, which of course is a unbelievable Kiddush Hashem, and it's the Mesor Atzmecha, they're giving over of themselves, their free will, to suffer and be tortured, and... But Mephoshim say that takes two minutes, and there's if a person, Chas Shalom, is thrown into fire, it doesn't take two hours for him to die. It could go very quickly. But the v'nikdashti, the harder part, is to live a whole life. Not the two minutes or the five minutes of death. But when a person every day is clean and is proper in his speech and he exudes what a yid should be or at least tries to be, he is giving over a Kiddush Hashem. And the Chavetz Chaim said, for instance, that if today a person, he said this a hundred years ago, wants to be Mekayim, Kiddush Hashem, so he, if he says Kedusha, Kadosh, 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 and Baruch Kavod Hashem Mimkom, and he looks up when he says it, that is today, Bizman Azeh, Kiddush Hashem of a person giving over themselves, Mesor Atzmecha, Vekade Shemi, that that is the Kiddush Hashem that the person wants in his lifetime. Everyone wants to make a Kiddush Hashem, you know, and you don't have to throw yourself into the fire. <laughs> Uh, so somebody, uh, they bring out the plate of kugel and people are taking as if they never ate uh, the, the kugel by the Kiddush like, like, uh, like it's unbelievable. Um, and, you know, so yes and gesund to hate, you know, let them eat and enjoy, but uh, somebody who wants the piece of kugel and sees somebody didn't get and takes the piece of kugel and gives it to the other person, that's a Kiddush Hashem that shows another year how to live 
and how to have Avas Hashem and, and, and Yiras Hashem and V'yahavta L'reacha Kamocha. It exudes goodness, which is a tribute to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the ultimate Kiddush Hashem. Like when a person does something and he thinks, Rabbana Shalom, I'm having a guest or somebody came to the door and I gave him tzedakah, but it was so cold out, I went and I stopped what I was doing for two minutes and I made him a hot tea and I brought it to the door or I brought him a chair to sit down for two minutes and drink the tea and warm up and say a, a, a smile at him and say a good word. That's a Kiddush Hashem. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a nachas from that. And the Sforim say that before a person does whatever he does, if he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm doing this, forget about me, forget about schar, forget about anything. This is on a silver platter, a gift for you to give you a nachas ruach. That is the biggest nachas ruach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because he is accentuating and underscoring what Hashem likes the best, the most of everything. And that's helping another Yid, putting another Yid before oneself and bringing out the best like that. Now the Medrash in discussing all of this goes through a whole list of this one was Mechaev, you know, like people come, they're nifter after 120 years, and they ask the medrashas, they ask somebody, um, why didn't you learn more Torah? So the Gemara says that the man answers, well, I had Baruch Hashem so much, I didn't have time to learn, I had to watch my properties, I had it that. So the, the, the Medrash says that there was a Tana so rich that he had 10,000 towns he owned. 10,000. That's the number the Medrash gives. And so he, was, he had a lot to look after, but he was learning all day. So they answer him, well, I, I, were you, you, you were richer than... And when it came to, let's say, a person, they said, well, you know, why are you busy doing so many Averis? So they said, well, I was a Baltaiva. I couldn't hold myself back. So they said that, they say to him, well, you, you didn't have more temptation than Yosef at Tzaddik. And you see, he got the title Tzaddik. We don't call anyone else tzaddik. Avram Avinu, Yitzchak Avinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, David HaMelech, Aaron HaKoyim, but no one is called tzaddik. Uh, except for Yosef. And he was tempted more than you were tempted. So the Svasemis asks on this and says, what is the mentor saying? That they bring a proof, they marshal support to their position against this man, the Baltaiva, from Yosef Atzad. But Yosef Atzadik was one and only. He was at the level that he could pull himself up. The average guy says, I'm not Yosef Atzadik. So what are you asking me, Akasha, that why was I so thirsty for the Averis I was doing well, Yosef Tzaddik also had the opportunity and he didn't do it. So the answer he should say is, yeah, but I'm not Yosef Tzaddik to pull myself out like that. So asked the Svasemis. So he answers and said, of course, the average person is not Yosef Tzaddik. But Yosef Tzaddik gave over to claw yourself the ability to fight off the Sahara. That means his achievement as being super tzaddik wasn't that a person is compared to him, but he's, but he's told 
You, you weren't bigger than Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef HaTzadik saw to it that every year after his life would be able to be imbued and have a yesod, have a foundation of Tahara and Kedusha enough that he could fend off the Yetzirah. That's what they're talking about, Yosef HaTzadik. Not comparing the levels of Madrega, the simple guy, to Yosef HaTzadik, but that we have the ability to pull ourselves above and beyond uh, where we stand because of Yosef HaTzadik. Now, the the Sedra begins with Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, Emor el Hakoanim b'nei Aharon, v'yomarto alehem lenefesh lo yitama v'yamov. And Rashi quotes the Chazal right away. Emor v'yomarto. In other words, it's a double expression. It's superfluous. It's extra. It says, Emor el Hakoanim, speak to the Kohanim. Via Marta Alev, and you should say to them. Once you said Emor, say, what do you have to say? Say a second time. So, uh, so Rashi says and brings the Chazal, Lahazer Gedolim Al Hakatanim, that the older Kohanim had to be specifically told in a very specific way, extra. Now, Emar was for the Kohanim. The Amarta, their children. That you have to tell a child that when you're playing with your group and they are near a cemetery, they can play ball and go catch the ball. If it fell in the cemetery, they can go in. But you're a Koyen, you can't do that. So that's the via Marta, that the older Koyanim had to teach the young ones that they were not allowed to go into that cemetery, that you are a Koyen and you cannot defile yourself. Now, we find that there's three places that this idea of, of telling adults and that they have a tzivu, a command to imbue the t children with that idea. Three places. One is here by Koyanim, that the older Koyanim had to bring up the level of observance of, against Tumma to the young Koyanim. And by Shrotzim, it says... Lo sochlu, that you're not allowed to eat insects. And the Gemara learns, lo sa'alchum, that you cannot feed children. That means if someone says, well, he's only six years old, what's the difference? He's not even in the years of chinuch, like nine years old, that you have a chiv of chinuch. So the Gemara says that you cannot feed them anything from the day they're born, anything that is not 100% kosher. And we've spoken in the past because kashras has a dimension that no other thing has of being um, very strong um, that it affects the ruchnias in a dimension that no other Avera can do. That means if someone is Machal Shabbos, it doesn't overall encompass the Kedusha of, of, of him. That means he's doing an Avera, he's violating and whatever, but by food, it's metame the nefesh, and it's only by food. So therefore, the pasuk comes to tell you 
that don't think this is a little kid, two years old, or he's not even bar mitzvah, he's not even a chiyav of chiyav. It affects him. Don't feed him anything not kosher. And in another place, it says, lo so dam, that you're not allowed to eat blood. And there it says also, a double lotion, and it says, lahazer gedor lemalaktan, these three. So, we learn out, but the the Satmar Rebbe Zecher Tzadik Levrocha used to ask that if there's these three, why is there such emphasis by the Kohanim with the Toma more so than we find? That means the Gemara learns up. You can't give the tray food to a child. But here it makes it a stronger point. Why over here? So he always said, because you have to realize the achrayas that a parent has to a child. You shape and mold his attitude and his everything. And the Gemara even says there was a girl named Miriam Bas Bilga, and they took her by the door of her parents um, to punish her. And she married a goy, and she oh, and she came into the Mizbeach, to the Harabayas, and she walked over to the Mizbeach and gave it a kick, the Gemara says. And she said, Lucas, Lucas, that you, the Mizbeach, what are you robbing the money of Klal Yisrael that they have to go pay for all these carbonos? And they, these are poor people, and they have to buy carbonos. What are you? And then they're putting the carbon on your mizbeach. She kicked it, and and the the Satmar Rebbe said that why do we talk about her with what she said to the mizbeach? Why don't we stress the fact that she was terrible? She went and married a goy. And that's not mentioned. I mean, it's mentioned as a fact, but that's it. Because a person could end up marrying a boy that they saw someone handsome, and they fell in. It could be pure taiva. So said the Satmar Rebbe. And obviously, all the teaching and all the everything of a household didn't overcome the thirst and the lust for what she wanted. But the expressions of a child come from the house. If they didn't hear that in the house, they wouldn't be saying it. So we talk about this Miriam because she went over and said to the Mizbeach, you're robbing the Yidden of their money by expecting Korbanos? Where did she get that from? Says the Satmarevi from the house. That was from the dinner table. That was from what the father or the mother was busy saying about the rov or about the bezdin or about whatever in complaining about it. So says the Satmareva, and that's why the Mr. Via Marta is stressed to such a point over here where it's talking about the children and the Torah says it beferish and it's more prominent than in the other two places where it's said that it doesn't come out so blatant as over here because here we are involving the Koyanim and we want to underscore how they have to live their lives and it's only through the households that that's going to happen from the elder because that's the backbone of Paul Yisrael, the Koyanim, the service of the Beis Migdosh, the Kedusha of every, of Tahara, Birchas Kohanim, all coming from Koyanim. So the responsibility was very, very great and dynamic. So they had to uphold it, and that's why it's so stressed over here. A Freilichen and a Listikin week to each and every one of you.